CES 2024 is January 9th through 12th in Las Vegas, and we're giving you an exclusive look at the future with interviews to get you ready for the world's most powerful tech event, and an event that channels its power for good. Human security for all was an overarching theme at CES 2023, and CES 2024 will once again focus on the ways that technology can help people secure their health, wealth, freedoms, and future. CES is partnering with the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security and the World Academy of Art and Science on the Human Security for All HS4A global campaign. And this year, technology is officially the newest pillar of that campaign. But what will this really look like at CES, and how can you help promote your favorite technology as a force for good? Joining me now is Amanda Ellis, the former ambassador from New Zealand to the United Nations in Geneva, who is now at Arizona State University. We are also welcoming John Miller, former chairman and CEO of both AOL and News Corp Digital Media Group, who is now at Force for Good, an organization which describes itself as transforming capitalism for a secure, sustainable, and superior future. Welcome to you both. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, John, I know that you've been coming to CES uh, for a long time. What draws you to CES and to this human security topic at CES in 2024? For me, first, I'll, I'll answer uh, from a business context. I always find it the level set that I that I look forward to at the beginning of every year. You, you really get a, a chance to see what's coming, wh- where companies are positioning themselves. It gives you a whole context for, for the upcoming year, and, and that's why I think I've been an attendee for a long time. And then last year was the first time ever the show was themed, and it was themed around this human security for all uh, messaging, which was really fantastic you know, from, our, from obviously our point of view, and I think going forward for the idea that CES can play a role in these kinds of issues. And, and so I think we established that last year, and this year looking forward to amplifying that um, as the issues are still very much with us. And Ambassador Ellis, I understand this will be your first time at CES. What draws you to CES and this human security idea? Well, I am so excited to see the tech world and particularly the initiative that John is leading around Force for Good. We know that technology has absolutely transformed our world. And if we go back to the United Nations original definition of human security for all, way back in 1994, it was around freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom to live in dignity. And in my previous roles as a development economist at the World Bank, the OECD, then running New Zealand's development agency, we really saw how at an individual level, tech for good could make such a huge difference to this concept of human security. So I am super excited to go and be alongside veterans like John. It's so important that we bring our big international institutions like the UN and the brilliance of the tech world more together to help create better futures. And John, you brought up the focus on human security last year at CES. Can you remind us how that actually shows up in the fabric of the event itself and maybe some of the ways that we can expect it to show up at CES 2024? Sure. And again, it was the first time that CES had ever done anything like that. So it, it, it was really great to see. There was signage in, in most of the main pavilions and, and, and ex- exhibition spaces. So it was pretty hard to miss if you were just walking in. And, and that was you know, really done in collaboration with uh, the CTA all, all the way through. Then there were a series of panels uh, in the Great Mind series and elsewhere um, that, that brought together some of these different themes that we've already touched upon in, in the different areas around human security. And then one thing I think we'll add this year, hopefully, is also involving uh, the marketers uh, that are there and and the brands, because they have a a great interest in this, obviously. So I think we're going to look to do more with them this year, and that'll be one of the additions for 2024, in addition to continuing things like the Great Minds series. So we want to be as uh, as much as part of the fabric of the show as we can be uh, in 2024. Sorry to jump in. I'm just excited to... (laughs) Think about the the opportunities that there are, and I'm probably one of the least tech-savvy people on the planet, but I'm so excited by the individual opportunity that it offers. And so for me, the excitement of thinking out of the box 
Previously, we talked about national security. And when we look at the age of the Anthropocene that we're now in, we're now powered by human action on our planet. And we are seeing the role that technology can play to help mitigate, for example, the escalating climate crisis, to help solve poverty through things like fintech. And for me, the opportunity to really put those things together and have everybody understand that tech has the ability to really, in this decisive decade, help steer the ship, the age of the Anthropocene, in the right direction. And, and if I might even take off on that, and part of the reason we, we, we are in, we're embracing CES and being embraced is that we also think these kinds of things and, and solving these issues and tackling these issues is actually good business. We're, we're not really here to just advocate philanthropy and so on, though that's fine. But this is really, yeah. we believe the companies that, that help solve these issues will be the companies that own the future, so to speak, in terms of their performance and, and, and how well they do. And so we, we want that message to get out there too, that we're, we're, we're really encouraging the embracing of these, these principles as good business as well. Uh, and we think that's really key to, to, to the understanding of what we're trying to do. And, and John, you obviously have a CEO, song. C-suite uh, mindset. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the business cases that you can make for someone who is hearing a conversation like this one and thinking, yeah, that sounds great, but I, I'm really in this to make money? Yeah, and, and look, it's 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 a, it's a great question because business leaders have to confront the, the, that question every day to perform in their in, in their jobs. And so let's start with with where you did, but it, it, with the simple stuff, which is if you're a brand and a, and, and a products to market, consumers around the world are actively making choices for brands that stand for something, and stand for you know human security is one of those aspects that that, that consumers care about, and will make a differential choice as to what they consume on that basis. So that's just one. Two is, and, we see, and I see this a lot in the companies I work with, um, in, in hiring. If you don't have these kinds of principles as part of what you're willing to articulate as a company, it will affect uh, who, you, who, who you get to hire and who applies to work at, at your company. Uh, for a while back, I was uh, uh, an advisor to Unilever, for example, which is one of the companies that has been really out front of this for, for a long time, out front of environmental issues. And they rank very, very high, right after Facebook and Google, actually, in terms of company choices for people to work at in a LinkedIn survey. And that's remarkable when you think of the products they make compared to, say, with the time Facebook, now Meta, and, and, and Google, now Alphabet. <laughs> um, you know, to, ha to be up there in that league is really, a quite, in terms of being a first choice, is really about the, the, the values they had as a company. So those are just two simple ones. But beyond that... Technology is, is so rapidly evolving to, to be in a position where it creates not just products but solutions to these large issues. And that's why I say if you're part of those solutions, that's where the money flows are going. That, that, that's where developing yeah. countries are going to put their efforts as much as they can. That's where uh, established and, 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 the, and the large uh, leading economies are going to rebuild their economies around. So the investment spend – and the returns are going in this direction. So the more you can, be, you can embrace that, we feel, the, the faster you can not only grow your, as, as a company, but you'll be doing some good in, in, in the process. And Ambassador, I'm sure you can follow up on that with some more expansion from a development economist point of view, as you said. Absolutely. And, and just before I do, I was thrilled when I was at the World Bank to work closely with Unilever. And as Paul Polman says, there's no business to be done on a dead planet. So I love John's focus that you mm -hmm. can do well by doing good. And for me, that's what makes CES such an exciting venue aligned with the human security issue. Now, of course, we, for the first time in human history, actually have a global development agenda. All 193 United Nations member countries signed off on the UN Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. And it's a 15-year global agenda. So really exciting to see how it is that tech is, as John said so eloquently, helping to provide solutions to poverty, health issues. And we look at what happened in tech with the global pandemic and how quickly the use of high tech 
was able to pivot to save literally hundreds of millions of lives. So for me, that was just so exciting. Now, from my perspective, really right down at the grassroots level, one thing that I find particularly uplifting is around finance, having been a former banker. So looking at how fintech is able to empower small businesses and particularly women who are often excluded from traditional banks because of a whole raft of legislative reasons. And just as an aside, no country in the world has yet achieved full gender equality and only 14 have even legislated for it. So when we look at a disadvantaged group in developing economies, the role of technology to be able to leapfrog some of those institutional problems and empower women at the grassroots has really been behind the microfinance revolution. And for me, that's one of the really exciting uses of fintech. And now, of course, we're seeing a whole range of very sophisticated consumer products in business. Now, the flip side is we also need tech to be protecting. There are always nefarious actors and being sure that that uh, the consumer is aware and savvy and protected is that flip side of human security. Yeah, and one of the things Amanda just touched upon and goes back to what I was saying is the companies that, that, that don't embrace these things, we believe are going to get leapfrogged and, 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 and they will be potentially left behind. And, and certainly we've seen that the pace of technology development is only increasing. It's not slowing, it's only mm-hmm. increasing. And probably you know the AI revolution will, will further that. And so you really, you know, we feel you really need to embrace these opportunities to stay to stay even at the parity that you would like to as a mm-hmm. business. So we, th- so again, we believe in the business uh, proposition here as well as the the human proposition. Yeah, and John, the point that you made about. Uh, employees is a really critical one. Data that we have seen very recently show that millennials overwhelmingly want to work for companies that have a purpose. And so this idea as tech as a force for good, which you embody, is such a critical one for those in the war for talent. And obviously that is a really important business differentiator. So we're seeing that millennials are really voting to work for companies with a mission. And human security for all is that next big idea where we really understand that the nation state, which is what our international institutions are still premised on, is very old fashioned when we live in a world where we have global pandemics, a global climate crisis, where individual human security is actually impacted. So for me, very exciting to see that this is good business and that business as a force for good is helping to create a race to the top. I want to get both of your perspectives on this next question, which is how much of this initiative is celebrating things and acknowledging things that the tech sector is doing already or would be doing already? And how much of this is you actually calling on technology leaders to do something more, to do something different? In other words, is there still a gap between what technology companies generally are are doing and what you want them to do? What is that gap and and what are we doing to try and uh, fill that in? So uh, I I guess we can just start with you, John. Yeah, well, you've asked a very good question because we want to do both. Um, we want to, we, we really want to acknowledge and, as you say, celebrate the very real things that are that are happening and, and developing, and the companies that are doing them, and they are real, and it is increasing. At the same time, the the the, the challenge is daunting, and if you go to to the SDGs that, that Amanda was talking about a few moments ago, one of the things we've analyzed is how much money it takes to achieve some of those goals. And the numbers are very daunting. They are in the trillions, and they are in the literally hundred trillion level. So the only way that's going to happen is if, is if governments continue to support these types of things, but also, as I've been saying, businesses really get behind it. And in order for that to happen, they have to see it being good business, as we've, as, as we've discussed. So there's a celebration, there's a challenge, and there's an opportunity. Because again, when, that, when the gap's that large, That also means the economic gain that you can make as a business is that large, which is part of why I've been saying that this is such a, you know, such an opportunity. But it is both and it is daunting. And we try not to to emphasize overly much the depressing 
aspects. They're there. I think we know them. I think we're all experiencing, wherever we may live, different elements of, of climate change, for example. Uh, it's, it's really coming home in, in, in a way that never had before. I'm a New Yorker. Uh, you know, there was an orange, you know, orange sky this this summer from you know the fires and so on, and it was quite yeah. strange. So even if you live in an area that you don't necessarily think is the front lines, that's changing very rapidly on you. So I think people realize that, and, and that's not as much the mission that we that we try to 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 have. What we try to really focus on are those solutions, pointing out what's working, pointing out what's good, pointing out what needs to be done, and and it's, and pointing out these the, the inherent incentives to that. And the, and, and the other thing I'll just say in, the, in, in, in closing on this question, is because it's a great question, is we also want to keep it very human-centric. This is, this is really about how does it affect actual people from in their daily lives and how does that um, continue to hopefully be improved and not threatened. And so we try to really bring it back to that, you know, that level, if you will, of the human, the, the human as lived world. Um, and that, I think, is the way that it, it also becomes you know, really front and center for people because we all are experiencing something like that in our lives. Love that. So I'm going to jump right in because I really like that framing, the celebration, the opportunity, and the incentives. So in terms of celebration, I wanted to give some very concrete examples. I'm privileged to be the co-chair of the UN We Empower, We Standing for Women Entrepreneurs, UN SDG Challenge, which was launched by Secretary General Guterres and the then President of the World Bank, Jim Kim, along with the Council of Women World Leaders, who are the current and past women heads of state, at the UN General Assembly back in 2018. And we have seen such an incredible number of women who are using tech for good across the world. So, for example, in the US, Floodbase, which is helping use uh, AI and big data to predict flooding and save women who are the majority of victims and communities. Looking at uh, medical online in Pakistan, for example, in Ukraine, using ed tech to ensure that Ukrainian children can continue to learn in over 121 countries where they are refugees and in bomb shelters, which is really tragic. But uh, Zoya Litvin, who is our awardee from Ukraine, has used ed tech for good. There are so many wonderful examples and uh, at, at ASU, we have something called Solar Spell, the Solar Powered Educational Learning Library, which brings to individual children in developing countries who have no access to the internet a solar hotspot that allows them to learn. So, so many fantastic examples, a celebration of the role that tech can play at a very human level. Now, before I come to opportunities, I want to talk about incentives. And right now, as John pointed out, huge cost to meet the SDGs. But as an economist, I can tell you that the cost of not meeting them is much higher. And there's a very interesting paper that has just come out by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and Ian Parry says the single biggest solution to the climate crisis is getting incentives right. Estimate of subsidies, implicit and explicit, to fossil fuels in 2022 were over $7 trillion, which is almost double what we spend globally on education. So we're subsidizing what we know is creating the climate crisis. <laughs> and they estimate that if we were immediately to be able to remove those subsidies, we would reduce emissions by 34%. And we need to get to 43%, as estimated by the scientists in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, by 2030. So we would be the vast majority of the way there. Now, in terms of the opportunity that tech can offer, we have, for example, the chief scientist for Carbon Mapper, Greg Asner, who's based here in Hawaii with me, and we're mapping carbon at, at point source. And that rolls up into a much bigger community called Climate Trace, tracking real-time atmospheric climate emissions, using big data and AI to go right down to the facility level. And it's how I discovered that in New Zealand, there are actually some coal plants being run by Fonterra, our big dairy company. 
I didn't know. So there's nowhere to hide anymore. And I think that technology empowers the individual to then take action with their parliamentarians and be able to say, hey, this is going on. We know. And you guys need to be really living up to the commitments you made under the Paris Agreement. So for me, the huge opportunity, particularly in climate, for tech as a force for good is to empower the individual human to know what's going on, hold business to account, and vote with our wallets. Really, really appreciate those specific examples. And John, are there technologies, are there areas of the show that you're going to be gravitating toward as you think about examples of human security? Well, there's a number. Everything from from things that that, that remove carbon from the atmosphere on, on a on a home based level, for example, and and also um, admit less carbon uh, into the atmosphere from homes. Homes is one of the areas that 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 you know puts a lot of. Uh, um, has a big impact on climate change. Um, for the, for example, one, but one of the areas that's very personal to me is with the um, development of AI. There's so many you know rapid uh, advances that are coming from that in, in really all disciplines, and you want to see how that. I want very much want to see how that's filtering out um, into into all the different areas from from medical to big data, etc. But I am also personally very concerned with disinformation. It's 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 one of the things that I, I spend a fair amount of time on. Because I think, as we all know, the potential for creating all kinds of information with AI, including deliberate disinformation, is just going up ex- exponentially. And I think that is really one of the big risks, um, frankly, that, that the, the world faces now, because we really do need to have the ability to have facts, as it were, that we all can uh, trust in and really abide in and use in, as we discuss things. And that's a, that's a general statement, of course, but I think with, with AI now, we, we have just huge um, potential for not only great information and great things like education around the world, but also tremendous amount of disinformation. And I'm, I'm going to be very curious to, as to how that plays out at the show and, and, and who's, who's demonstrating what in that yeah. regard. We have to understand that we're talking at a time when people are concerned about technology across a whole number of factors um, around um, inequality. Basically, te- basically, the idea that technology is a force for good is not necessarily a universally shared kind of go-to emotion for folks uh, across a number of different uh, reasons. And so I, I would love to hear from both of you, starting with you, Ambassador Ellis. What do you say to someone who you try to give them this tech is great, uh, you know, human security for all, technology for good message, and they're mostly concerned or even afraid about technology's role and how it's shaping the future. And this is such an important issue. I was at TED Global this year and heard Greg Brockman talk about AI. There was a whole session on it, which was very eye-opening because drones can be used to deliver products to people who may be homebound, but they can also be used to deliver weapons. So we have to be very clear-eyed, and this is where we need a real robust set of regulations and rules. And I know this is my experience, so of course I will come back to that, but we can't just trust that without guardrails, people are going to do the right thing. Unfortunately, not everybody has the same ethos as John. I wish I wish they did. The world would be an absolutely perfect place. But it is our role to shine a spotlight on the potential for misuse and how we can put in guardrails. And the concept of human security for all very much addresses that. Now, in terms of some of the practical examples I gave you earlier, I think at a, a, a personal level, people are seeing the great things that technology can do. My mother, for example, is in a rest home and finds it difficult to read now in her 90s, but she can use technology to listen to podcasts, which wasn't possible 20 years ago. So there are some very practical examples of how technology can make people's lives better. And through the We Empower competition, we see so many new ones each year that we haven't thought of before. I think, oh, wow, there's another terrific idea, a great use of tech. But for me, like John, disinformation is a really critical one. 
And it's so hard to know how do you actually research. My husband and I have this debate almost every night at the dinner table because he's a brilliant researcher. And I'll say, I saw this today. And he'll say, yeah, now what was the source? Unwind that. And it's so important, I think, that we can help educate, and I hope CES will help do this. What is the source? What is the trusted source? How can we be sure that something is real and not just beautifully generated to look real. Yeah. And John, your organization is called Force for Good, so I know you can bring us home with an optimistic uh, message here. Yes, and also Force for Good works very closely with the World Academy of Art and Science on the um, Human Security for All projects. So we're very closely knit on, on these things. And I think the, the optimistic thing from a technology point of view is that the gap that, that we mentioned earlier in terms of investment and what's needed is actually quite daunting. But a, a, a tremendous amount can be made up of, of that from the tech sector and existing technologies plus emerging technologies. So this is not something that we have to put off or wait uh, you know, for years. In fact, the ability to, to really affect the outcomes are, is very much present now in, in, with existing technology, again, developing technology, and with the hopefully the, the, the inspiration, if you will, and, and as we were talking, the opportunity to capture um, – to capture those in, in new and emerging markets as well as rebuilding and remaking the, the existing large economies. Because if we do both those things together, the gap will actually shrink by 30 to 40 percent just on that alone from the technology sector and the investments that it can make. So it's really um, – that's really a positive message in, in the midst of what is a, overall a, you know, still remains a daunting task. Well, ASU's Amanda Ellis and Force for Goods, John Miller, talking about human security for all at CES. Thank you both so much for joining us today on CES Tech Talk.